Chapter 32 Recovery Training Mission The base was going to do two priority missions and one more supply mission while we learned all the capabilities of our new ship and its structure. The supply mission was going north to Denver to find more food stocks under the snow and ice. It was still somewhat accessible. This would be the seventh mission there and would be routine. Amy and I's second mission would be the first priority, then there would be a second. The Svavlabard Global Seed Vault on the Norwegian island of Spitsbergen near the town of Longyear Bayern in the remote Arctic Svalbard Archipelago about 1300 kilometers or 810 miles from the North Pole. The other priority mission was to retrieve eggs and sperm or genetic material from bank specifically designed for animal species on Earth, a frozen zoo of sorts similar to the seed bank but closer in San Diego. There normally would be two fighters escorting the recovery freighter or cruiser and all would have cloaking capabilities. The new improved force fields would also help greatly. The two fighters could take on a small army easily and the cruisers were even more heavily armed. The cruisers reminded me of the flying fortresses of World War II. We were shown by magic from their web archives what happened during an attack while out gathering needed supplies and the group of lone survivors who happened to show up where that recovery mission was working. Basically, those who Magic and the boys saved that day and brought in from the cold were the normal people. The reason to try to develop personal cloaking was revealed to us as we viewed another mission because some of our own people took bullets and were killed. Magic Square revealed that our original backer millionaire Bob was one of the people killed on that scavenging mission. They had cloaking for the ships and a few other metallic objects that could be cloaked, like our hangar doors, the beacons, and such, but it did not work for people that were exposed and in the open. Nevertheless, the fighters cut the smids down to pieces that day as they were hunting normal humans. They got too close to the operation that day, and we were able to save a few of the normal people. Magic, Amy and I walked over to our ship and we got comfortable checking the systems on the outside then on the inside. Magic was captain and leader of the ship as we trained on this mission to make sure we knew our new systems inside and out since so many more changes have occurred in the last 14 years since they developed the newer technology. Communication here at the base wasn't done with radio or any airway frequency but rather with small drones that projected 3D holographic images and messages as they went back and forth between the base and the ships. Within the base and the ships communication was a whole different story. It was shielded. With the drone technology they had a miniature version of our flight tech and almost they were as quick as radio frequency communications. In this way what was achieved using drones was nearly undetectable because they also were cloaked but there were sometimes slight time lapses. 
You have to take the good with the bad sometimes to survive, but they were really quick. On this planet, those drone systems in real time were very important. Our lives and everyone at the base were depending on them to be flawless. There was also a scout drone that plotted our safest course, which we would then execute with a push of a button. It was always slightly ahead of us. It would transmit in shortwave only because no one used shortwave at all anymore. Using it would not reveal us to our enemy. Our force field would protect us now even at a standstill, but there were still limits on what it could withstand. We were in our fighters doing flight checks for almost 10 minutes, learning where everything was as we ran down the checklist on this flight. We would be mostly observing, though. Magic gave the word, finally, to lift off, and the hangar door opened, and we lifted up about six feet off the ground, then retracted the landing gears, and floated toward the door. I then cloaked us, as commanded, and we floated out into the daylight. We were the lead ship. Everyone else in this mission would take orders from this fighter. There was one other fighter on our side, and we flew in a triangular formation. This formation was a smaller profile and helped the cloaking of all three ships blend together. The freighter had a bigger crew along with those that would recover all they could find as quickly as possible, and if we could, we would avoid a fight. They were armed to the teeth also. As we flew, Magic released the locator drone, and it was gone in a flash. It would stay on target till we got to our destination, watching and sending radar information back to us through the shortwave signal. Meanwhile, I just thought of something to ask Magic. Let me ask you something. I got real close to the space station. Is there anybody on it? He said, no, when things got real bad down here, they wanted to be with their family, so they evacuated it in 2023, November, I think, and they left it on remote. It's still sending data down to the blokes at NASA, wherever they're at now. Do you think they are still receiving information? No, probably not anymore. We listened in on it for anything important, and it stopped after a couple of years and went silent. Why do you ask? I thought of something. Is there any way to recover it and take it with us? There could be many things we could use it for, plus it will hold more people. What do you think? It is possible. Less trips between worlds if the number of people we save increases. Yes, mate, that is a very good idea, and no one would ever know. We could be in the bush before they knew what happened. Think about all the gear we could recover from that, and I'll bet there are still quite a few spacesuits on board. What about the stress on it, I asked. That's easy. He hesitated and took a drink from his flask. We used one of the extra drives to fine-tune a force field just for its hull, and that would be all it would be needed. And that wouldn't even stress that system like a spare that purrs, mate. Blimey, it's really simple, a cakewalk. How many people nowadays can it hold, I asked. Oh, about 20 crew members. That's not bad, plus supplies. They've expanded it and improved it, and it has some of the newest solar cells the government could buy. The computer came up on the screen and showed the download from the scout drone and we had everything we needed to know about our course and destination. Then the no threat showed on the screen and the course was set 
in all the ships at once. Then Magic turned and said, Watch this, as he pressed enter, and we were there, and all that happened was our screens blinked, and it was like we went to a different TV station, as if we changed the channel on our screens. Our view had changed to Denver, and we were there, still in formation, with all the other ships reacting with our command. We all posted our ships in different places around the area where the freighter's crew were going to work. We were now their guards. We learned most survivors here were hidden in the wilderness and hard to locate. But sometimes when these guys had to forage, these holdouts would sometimes walk up on our crews as they scavenged. Some of them had vehicles too, and those were collected also. You know, like side-by-side, off-road, miniature, four-wheel drive toys. They then recruited those who are ready and want to leave with us, but some would rather keep doing what they were doing and would choose to stay, not trusting us. Magic started to explain more. No, one's, no one is forced. They take help, but some would rather stay where they are. But they know we are out here, and our crews have given them a way to signal us if they change their minds. Some missions involve rescuing people that got tired of roughing it. This is when it can get dangerous sometimes. But most of the times, when the crews on guard duty are scanning the area, Around the salvage operation, nothing unusual happens. I suddenly couldn't help noticing the beauty of the winterscape here and the drifts of snow covering the buildings on the western and northern sides. Some of the drifts riding up so high that they partially covered the roofs and beyond and some completely were buried looked like just big mounds of snow but you could tell what was under those mounds of a covered house or business or part of a street showing through that these were the places to look for supplies the wind was responsible for covering and uncovering the building so there was always a new option and this would occur with each visit because this new ice age was relentless and uncaring. The ice sheet was about 100 miles north of our position and visible on the horizon. What a sight and barrier it was. Now, because of the cloaking devices, they now have more access to more open areas with buildings or houses. As it became dusk, the temperatures started to drop. It became even colder now, and we only had a couple of minutes left till dark. That's when it would be well below zero, minus 30 or more. While here, we did use two-way radios to get reports from time to time from each other when necessary but transmitting was kept at a minimum. We were on the east side of Denver, the flatlands, or the beginning of it, with many stores that lined what was a highway nearby. The retrieval crew finally dug through the snow and ice into the interior of a Kmart. They got lucky today. There were vacuum packed dry goods still inside miscellaneous items scattered about and some needed clothes winter clothes were wanted the most but any clothes found were prized as we watched and drank our hot coffee magic explained some more about the global events that were taking place well mates we don't know how far this ice sheet will push to the south it is still growing or rather moving the scary thing is that sometimes it moves several miles when the weight of the sheet can't press down and subside the land 
and that's when the bedrock stops. It stops its downward submission. It then slides and that can take mountains down. The shape of it and the position of it is also to our west in California down the valley and the edge of Arizona which means that any uncertain time it will surround the base. Maybe in a year, maybe longer, maybe in a day or two. We just don't know. So what you found at Kepler, without us having to guess where to go, is a blessing. This is why everyone at the base is happy with the both of you. He continued with a weary look in his eyes. We thought about living on Mars or the moon, but even for a short time it wasn't an option. It'd be too close for comfort and probably would be depressing since we have been basically a colony already for all these years. Cabin fever mates can be a mental killer. We both said, we understand that. After a long silence, I looked over at Amy and it looked like she was in a daydream. I snapped my finger in front of her face and she came out of it and simply said, Magic, we don't have much time. I feel about two months max. Really? How do you know? I just know, and probably less time than that. You'll see and know soon enough and that's all I get and can say except Mike and I knew when rounding the moon somehow that we weren't going to stay for long and now I know for sure. Magic looked at me and I can only give him a look clenching my lips and nodding my head up and down that gave him my approval of her prediction. With raised eyebrows and twisted lips saying with just that in feared she was more likely right because of her past premonition we had better believe it and take heed I said what should we do he asked before any of us could answer the business at hand interfered there was chatter on the comm the report was the second crew was breaking into the building next to the Kmart they thought it was a restaurant and hoped that there was a cooler or a pantry that had not been pillaged. How long will this take, Amy asked. We never know, Magic replied. It all depends on what we find and how much of anything is unknown. But, if lucky, hopefully we get our fill. For instance, if we have retrieved all we can pick up and there is still more space, we then strip out the wiring, metals, electronics, copper pipes, things like that. They have till daylight, sun up in the morning. They may hit two or more buildings overnight. We'll be taking guard shifts all night and move with them as they move through the buildings, repositioning our posts. Tonight it will be overcast and it's going to get sharp dark, mates. No moon out tonight watch this. He flipped the switch and everything on our screens changed to night vision. You guys have thought of almost everything. We have tried to stay ahead of the curve while staying out of sight which has been quite difficult, he replied. How did you know to do all this, I asked. Well, trial and error mates, watching how other holdouts messed up. It dawned on us that there had to be something behind the idea of destiny or fate, whichever way you want to look at it, but we take no chances. By this time, it was obvious that certain roles were set for certain reasons unknown to us as individuals till it became obvious, so we keep rescuing the right technicians. Can you be more specific, Amy asked? Sure I can. Since we believe in Christianity, we knew what was going to happen before it happened. It was just a matter of thinking that the prehistory was correct 
and that all we had talked about was correct as it kept unwinding. It was revealed and we became super aware while building our defenses. Got it, Sheila? She replied, It was a destiny that had to be played the way you knew it did. That and knowing all the latest tech that gave us advantages and then finding them. That was a tough part, he said. As I sat and listened to them, it all made perfect sense. It was the only way to get to this point in time, I said. Exactly, Magic said. Think about the story you told us of your father's history, Mike. We kind of thought about it in the same way. Because it didn't tell us what would happen to those that didn't accept it all and that didn't become martyrs. What about the rest of us? Surely... There was an unknown destiny not described because we were the proof. We just couldn't quite think of why and now we know. It had to be hidden till a certain point to survive. What about your dad's history? My wife asked. His was an interesting story. He was one of King Peter's guards during World War II. There were 4,000 of them. The story is that 2,000 of them were exiled from Yugoslavia at the end of the war and the other 2,000 were killed, massacred. He had to go to England then, went back to France and joined the French Foreign Legion because communists after World War II took over his country. The French sent him to Vietnam, and af that was after a stay in Algeria, and there the same thing happened to him again with the French encirclement in the northwest Vietnam area. Ho Chi Minh's Viet Minh forces decisively surrounded and defeated the French at Bai Ben Pieu, a French stronghold besieged by the Vietnamese communists for 57 days. He was one of the 2,000 that got to walk out near the end of it in an, in an exchange of prisoners. Then he was freed after a lot was drawn. It was 10 Viet Cong to every Frenchman. He took two bullets, one in each war, and he was extremely lucky or blessed. I continued. Heck, the, the odds of him surviving all of that had to be high against him and very slim to say the least. Magic added, if we went back and helped Mike's father avoid one of those bullets out of compassion, then possibly none of us might be here. It is tricky but true. None of us can change that in any way, even though we have the capabilities to go back. You can't change what is destined by God, mates. When we realized our destiny was to be here and do what we were doing, we knew it had to change soon. And you are now confirming that and have been since we received your transmission. So... We remained hidden, only doing what we could for now. We knew that if we fought the enemy outright, we would lose. Plus, it took this long to have all the right tech. Good example, I said. If it didn't play out exactly as was set down by his destiny, then his son, you, for some reason or other, would mean that none of us would even be here. I see now, Amy said. Then my love asked, so now I have to wonder what our futures hold. We already know, don't we? She knew what I was talking about. Then, abruptly changing the subject, Magic asked, is everybody ready? for some more coffee. 
We all said yes to that idea since it was still early and now relieved that all this mental twisting was over for now, but really it wasn't. And it would continue for quite some time as the night set in. After a long silence, I decided to ask this. So there is no way to travel back and change things. No, Magic replied, because there seems to be a higher power that stops us, for lack of better words. That force wants it played out a certain way as I see it, because even God has his destiny for us if he even allows it or will intervene. Amy said, So we could say, by the grace of God, we go this way. Seems that way, Magic simply said. Agreed. What else can explain it? Amy said with religious convictions as she ended with, Praise Jesus, pass the coffee, something's coming this way. Before I could ask what, an alarm went off. There was incoming people running this way through the snow, and behind them something was in pursuit. It was a large animal, and it was closing in on them. Magic shouted, Protocol 1. Amy, send out the protocol. Amy's communicated to the workers, Protocol 1. Protocol 1. Out here, that means go dark. Lights out. And that meant also night vision and arms be ready. They were heading right up the street, or what used to be a street, right at us. Take us down to 30 feet, Magic shouted. Lower the bay door. I shouted out. Nothing in the air or on radar and complying. Then he gave the order to uncloak and lights on as the ship lit up the ground in front of the runners. The next order was spotlight the creature. As I did this and adjusted, we blinded the creature temporarily, and now we could clearly see that it was a giant bear, but not the ones we knew about. This was a mutated cross from polar bears and grizzly bears that had interbred and now were about the size of the extinct short-faced bear, which was much larger than anything that existed before all this happened. The light in its eyes from the ship slowed it down for a moment, which gave the runners more space. Then it seemed to use its sense of smell and continued the chase. There were five people almost to our lower door when Magic shouted, Fire! I shot three rounds in it and it stopped dead in its tracks, then turned and ran a few feet and dropped. This happened just as the runners hit the drop door, and once inside, Magic raised the door and shut them in our bay. Then he gave an order to cloak and return to our previous elevation, and for those in the bay to stow any weapons. They complied. Then the order to the ground crew to gather and process the meat if it wasn't tainted. Once locked in position above the site again, we checked on our new passengers. Amy gave the order to the ground crew for protocol 215, which was each group on the ground would choose one person who would stay armed and on guard because of the carnivore in the area while the others continue with retrieval operations and work. I went below to see what happened next. I asked, what happens now? Well, mates, we make sure that they are not mutants or reanimated hybrids. He then stood at the door to the bay and through the calm ordered them all to take off their hoods and hats and goggles, then one at a time to stand in front of the window at the door and turn their backs to the window so he could see if they had been altered at the base of their necks and head at about the C2 vertebrae. He turned to me and then said, 
They're scared, mate. They don't know who we are yet. They think we're the gov, which means they're probably all right, but watch. Because each time this happens, there will be different circumstances involved and many different reactions. Mostly good, but one bad one can ruin your day. Back on the comm, he talked to them again. Come on, mates. All weapons in the bin now. We aren't the gov. We're the rebels, too. Once he got their confidence, they showed us the back of their necks, one by one. When that was completed, Magic got all excited and shouted out to another crew member, They're all clean. Get them some alcohol to snicker. We're all going to shoot through soon. Let's get them warmed up. Tell the ground crews to take a break and warm up. And after that, go get that bear and hide the blood. Because of all of us on board and on the other ships could hear and were on the same comm for the moment, making sure we had them under control, they all laughed at Magic's return to Aussie slang when excited. Most of the time he had it under control. In between the laughter, though, some were asking for translation and poking fun. It was quite cute. What the hell snicker mean? All of this was new to Amy and me, so I had to ask many questions as experiencing this new lifestyle because so much had happened. And there was so much that happened while we were off world, it was hard to take it all in. In a matter of a few years, the horrific things that Christian religion prophesied happened one after another. The wars, the pestilence, the beginning of the death of this planet, and all of it was brought to a head now after centuries of infiltration by this alien demonic presence. They were always hidden behind the scenes, but every now and then, the hidden showed themselves and we knew they were here. They had been at it for centuries controlling governments and kingdoms through human greed and it was such a slow takeover many people didn't even know nor have a clue what was behind the superpowers of the world and many other radical nations. How insidious, I thought, and so clever. They had only the power to tempt in the beginning. It wasn't long after 2017 they finally revealed themselves as harbingers of advancement. They manipulated our genes, and when they did it, it was obvious and deceptive because no one believed till it was too late. They created clones and hybrids from the frozen dead now, and anyone they could capture that resisted. Two reasons. One, a slave, and two, the ultimate vicious killer. The clones were sometimes used as a body they could enter into to interact in this dimension, and that would make them look human, but there's a flaw. They have to implement a heart that beats at 95 beats a minute, and we monitor that as well. It never slows down. It can speed up, but won't last long. I asked Magic what he would have done if the rescued were clones, because the hybrids you could recognize pretty much face on, but the clones you had to look at from behind. His reply was, Well, mate, we would disable their cameras first, their eyes, by smoke and darkness in the bay, then basically kill them, take them into the low orbit, eject them. It becomes a bloody mess, but no bodies, no evidence, doing it in that order so they don't know our capabilities. Cameras? Where? I asked, not believing what he said. 
their eyes. They remove them and implant cameras. They are literally human drones, both the infiltrated clones and the hybrids both have the implant on their necks and you would never know by looking at their eyes. He continued, if just one of them gets by us, they will find our base. They are in communication with their leaders. They are all connected with implanted cameras. That's how they can see what they see. There is someone behind the curtain controlling their every move. They know we exist, but they don't know where. How do you know all this, I asked. We weren't the only rebel base out there in the wilderness. We taught each other what we knew as this evil unfolded, as we communicated at one time. There were many bases, others like us, who were fighting, and as they fell, we learned what not to do. He then related a few of the battles that went wrong and what happened to these other bases and people. Magic got excited about saving more people because we were what were left of the entire human race that was still normal as far as we knew. There were many of us who didn't join the opposition that was ruled by the shadow government those who weren't killed or martyred, and let's not forget that first disappearance that made people valuable in many ways for us, and now for our future. There is now a possibility of escape from here which nullified what seemed to be inevitable if we stayed. If we stayed, it would have been eventual destruction of the last of humanity here, Sooner or later, we would all get caught. The rescued knew they were on borrowed time just being out there in the open. They had seen many enemy scouting parties flying, driving, or on foot every few days. If rescues and possible salvaging were to continue, we would have to do that from a new base at a safe distance off-world. Once a rescue person learned all of this, they became very happy once again and put all their effort they could into the system of survivors. The rest of the night passed by quietly. As the day began to break, I asked, What do we do now, Magic? What's the procedure? Amy can send the new communications and now we'll give the survivors food and drink and keep them in the bay for now we're almost out of here and it's getting light out it'll be back to Duluth area in about a half hour if all goes well mates Duluth was the nearest town to our base and was long gone now this wasn't the first time I heard it mentioned seems that the name was familiar I thought nothing more of it at this time. Amy said, I just sent a drone to the base with our timeline and to let them know we have survivors. Wasn't long till we rolled it all up and we were all back at the base 15 minutes later at sunup. Our next missions would be to the genetic zoo and the seed bank. We would have to wait till the rescued were taken out of quarantine, off ship, and interviewed. Those were the rules as they remained locked in the bay of our ship. The doctors had to still check their heartbeats. There were good reasons to handle it this way. It was so they could not know at first where our base was located till trust could be undoubtedly established and they did this with anyone that was rescued. So far, no one wanted to leave. Once they were cleared and brought up to date on what the situation was and then what our capabilities are and our future plans are for all of us. 
there were guidelines and an orientation plus that was used for any new survivors that were rescued along with psychological evaluation or criminality. Once cleared and physically checked, they were given tasks or jobs to keep them busy and productive with which most took kindly to and accepted and everyone wanted to be a part of this once indoctrinated. These were the things that Magic filled us in on as we flew back. He then addressed the rescued and turned on the monitor in a cargo bay so they could see us as he spoke to them. Mates, we are taking you to our home. We are not the government. We are like you, rebels, holdouts, but highly advanced. You will be checked in by security in time and indoctrinated, and you'll have a choice to stay or leave. No one is forcing anything on you, so enjoy. This was told to them as the giant bay doors to the base uncloaked and opened. This was quite impressive and very effective, I said out loud. Yes, it is, mate, and puts them right at ease, and you know what? No one has ever left. We put down in the bay, and Amy asked, What's next? Ah, my little Sheila. We spend the night and do our next mission in a day or two, since we're safe and here now. We start our planning for that tonight, though. Sounds like a plan, I said. This would give us more time to double check the pathways with the drones the next day because of the distance, just to be safe. If we did any of this from orbit or not, all pathways would be considered. As we learn these things, we knew all this would be temporary. Everyone would know the latest news and no one would be in the dark about our goals even the newly rescued once indoctrinated. A camaraderie would take over just as in war among soldiers, one brother watching out for another. Our enemies would be coming at us from south of the border or from east of the Mississippi. There was no west coast as we knew it. So now to the meat of the problem. The Kepler Knights were taken there by an unknown force, but we suspect we know what that force was. That being said, we know what this evil force is and where it went. They went south and are concentrated around the equator, Africa, South America, wherever it's still warm. And we know what that force is, and it is up to evil. There had been a great migration of Europeans and Slovak Russians into Africa, along with the Chinese, with a great amount of bloodshed. Chi Chinese survivors also took the Philippines and Indonesia. Japan was gone. Most of the U.S. moves into Mexico and the northern part of South America and the islands which were now exposing more ground along their continental shelves. All of these survivors not with us but captured worked together with the dark alien forces against the rest of the world committing atrocities to make their atheistic view dominant. In order to survive, you either accepted or you didn't. If you didn't, you were either killed or converted. Everyone here now knew that this force was alien to humans, but alien in the sense of what religion taught for centuries. We now knew for sure that these were the fallen angels who were deceiving mankind for eons. This was for their own agenda, elimination, depopulation, and it was about jealousy. The world had now shrunk and was easier to patrol because of the ice sheets. There were many people that just 
joined that side basically and gave in to it. And most people who accepted the mark, which was basically an implanted chip for tracking, for identification, all which was for control, location, and payment for services rendered. They were also put to work for their agenda and to be able to stay human if they accepted the mark slash implant. The powers in place knew there were still holdouts and they hunted our kind feverishly while blaming the religious and the free for all the suffering over the millennia which was an unjust lie and excuse to implement their hidden brutality on those who wouldn't convert and those people were killed and in the most brutal way imagined. Amy and I realized it was all very real now and we learned all of this in only a few days but there were more questions that weren't answered that would be soon. We rested for the rest of that day and then that night we began preparing for that next mission which now had become and would be the most important one so far. This was and had to be the noblest, non-selfish of all of our endeavors. It meant survival for all that could be saved. This was for the survival of humans, animals, and plants. We were in essence going to become the next caretakers of an ark. We need to escape this world without detection and for now we had a destination to go to and we knew what we needed to be able to establish, which was a new uncorrupted society away from this earth. It was a second chance to continue and advance. This was the way that it was intended to be like to begin with. Next, chapter 33, that morning.